Okay, so hello and welcome back to everyone. I'm here now with a special lady, Lisa Singer. She is the Vice President Principal Analyst uh, of Forrester at Forrester, VP Principal Analyst at Forrester. We are so excited and happy to have you here, Lisa. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, so fact is that, you know, the best product and growth organizations continually assess and optimize their pricing and packaging strategies to drive profitable growth. So in these sessions, my dear crowd, uh, by PLG Disrupt, Lisa Singer will explain the essential research and decisions to drive PLG. So the session's main takeaways will be the questions to ask current and potential customers to understand their value drivers, also to how ide to identify the packaging approach that fits the offering and go-to-market strategies, as well as the steps for optimizing the offering pricing model to ensure it drives growth. So now I will leave the panel and I will give you the podium just for you to explain and present your wonderful talk. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so, so much. And oh. I'm really excited to talk to you today. When we think about packaging and pricing, balance is key as, as it is in many other areas of our lives. I talk to many friends, many colleagues, and so many people tell me that especially during these times, their lives are out of balance. Everyone is focused on just getting things done, work, family, homeschooling, and ensuring no one gets sick. It is so stressful. So now it's a good time to remember what makes for life that's in balance. You didn't expect I would speak to you today about this, I, am, I imagine, but certainly this is important. A core element of having a life in balance is first taking care of yourself eating a, a, a simple, well-balanced diet, getting good sleep, lots of exercise, then setting priorities. If you don't set the, the priorities, you're not gonna get it done. You wanna focus more on your kids, their schooling, you gotta set a goal for that. You wanna focus on doing more exercise, losing weight, setting those priorities is key. But balance also requires you to plan for the unexpected and not to be overwhelmed. You have a family fight, these things happen. Managing through it and, and ensuring it doesn't give you an undue amount of stress is really, really important. And then finally, I know it's easy to say, but it's critical to come at life with a positive viewpoint and learn how to not let things get you down. I'm not gonna tell you how to do that in this session. I'm sorry, but if anyone has any tips, please let me know. Similarly, to create balanced pricing and packaging for subscription or SaaS businesses, you need to focus on four key areas. First, it should be simple so that the sales process is not bogged down by the need to explain every element. Certainly, you product-led growth companies know that with your, with your simple freemium approaches. You also need to create optimum packaging and pricing to drive upsell so that you can sell additional components to your customers when they're ready for more. You also need to be su sufficiently complex so you can get revenue from larger companies or even from smaller customers who have more complex use cases and need more complex elements of your product. Last, you need your pricing model to deliver profitability while drive, driving strong value for your customer. So for product-led companies, there's a bit of a tug of war here between acquisition and monetization. And it's important to balance this when creating pricing and packaging. Serious Decisions has developed an approach for packaging and pricing. And what you see here is the Serious Decisions Pricing and Packaging Blueprint. It's a four-phase process and it is very much market focused. You see you're starting out understanding about the user, the buyer. It promotes growth and it helps ensure money is not left on the table. We use this model to help our clients 
often product managers or product marketers, develop their packaging and pricing strategies, often for SaaS and subscription offerings. The first area is about measuring value. It's about understanding the value of the offering and how it provides value to not just one set of buyers, but different segments of buyers. The second area is about how to use the structure of the offering. And by that, we mean the offering configuration and the pricing model to reflect the different needs of customers or segments and to ensure profitable growth and simplicity. The third area focuses on the approach to set that actual price. And here, you'll learn what you used about value, willingness to pay, you're going to, and then you're going to apply it to that offering structure. That final element includes the steps you need to take to ensure profitable business, such as enabling sales and explaining how your pricing aligns with value and how it's structured to ensure that more complex customers and use cases pay more for your offering. Today, we're just gonna focus on the two, first two areas of the blueprint, specifically on how we see the most successful organizations going about measuring value of the offering through a better understanding of needs, and then how that learning is then leveraged onto uh, the offering structure, both the metering or the pricing model, and the configuration. Let's first talk about measuring value. I'm often asked, how do we ask our customers about pricing? Well, the answer is, don't talk about pricing, talk about value. That should be the topic of, of your conversations with customers. And I can't overestimate the importance of also getting input from a range of customers because customer needs from one industry uh, might, might vary greatly from uh, those from another industry and, and from companies of different sizes. Users who are working small companies might have slightly different needs um, than users of big companies and product led growth companies will find that as they grow more mature and as they start to go up market. So to do this, you wanna do customer research and, and you might do quantitative research. Here's an example of some qualitative research. So customer interviews. What you see here are some sample questions you might ask during a customer interview focused on understanding value. And one of the key questions to better understand value is to ask your customer how they address their needs prior to using your offering. This will better help your customer figure out what the, what kind of value your offering provides and can even help you calculate the economic value of the offering. When you ask about value, some might say, well, you, your offering helps them complete tasks quicker. Others might point to increased business. Ask for specifics. Try to drill down on how much time they've saved or how much time a team has saved and try to drill down to what that actual cost is. You'll be pleasantly surprised what you hear and actually your customers understanding the value helps them with a business case to ask management to pay for the offering across a larger group. So not only is this going to help you understand how to price, it's also important in uh, the keys for selling. So often they might tell you about some of the hard benefits, but also ask about the soft benefits as well, such as like increasing confidence or reducing risk. These types of benefits tend to drive even more sharing and virality of your product. These are things that they're, they're emotional connections and, and your users are gonna talk about that with one another. Do some internal discovery as well. You can learn a lot from your customer success people, your support people, your sales people. Ask some of the questions you see here. And some of the questions, some of the answers will help you identify the differences among customers. Which customers gain the most from your offering, for example, and why? This information will help you better create packaging and pricing that drives balance. It's going to drive growth and profitability. 
Let's now talk about some simple things you can do with structure and how product configuration approaches can help you ensure you meet the needs of, of the different buying segments. I'm sure you've thought about the packaging of your product. And generally there's four different approaches to packaging as you see here. At the far left is that all-in-one approach. Everything's included. On the right is the customized approach. The offering is then assembled, bespoke for each customer. In the middle, you see a functional approach. These are packages targeted to different functions. And then you see the, the tiered approach where packages of different complexity and, and price points are offered. And let's talk about how you, how you assess um, which package might be right for your offering. And it turns out when we look at that four criteria, those four balance criteria I talked about earlier, and they're on the left-hand side there, you can see, actually the right one depends on the type of customer you're targeting and where you are in your offering life cycle. Simpler models like an all-in-one approach might work best for targeting for, for young companies trying to get traction in, in a market, in an offering area. When you use an all-in-one approach, you don't have to spend the time tailoring or explaining how one offer differs from another. But it doesn't allow for account growth or monetizing value for different needs because you've now given everything away in one fell swoop. So there's definitely, obviously, some drawbacks there. Fully customized is best if you're selling more complex offerings, big ticket software to large enterprises. And you wanna engineer packaging and pricing more precisely rather than having uh, too much discretionary discounting. Most organizations, <clears throat> they use some, some component of functional and tiering. One of these in the middle, and often they're using a combination of the two. Let's talk about tiered uh, packaging and pricing because we're often seeing that and how the questions I often get is, well, how do I do it? How do I, how do I know what goes into the different tiers? First, you have to go back to what you learned for in your interviews or your surveys and identify the different customer needs and use cases and then separate your offering into components, into generally four buckets. There's the core offerings. These are the min minimum set of components of your offering that make your offering viable. They are required in any package, even you know premium to, a, to an extent, but any package really needs to have some, the, the core offering, certainly the, the paid packages do. Ancillary components generally are needed by these more sophisticated customers, generally about 50% of your audience. Then there's these the more niche elements. They're needed by about 25% of customers. Finally, you've got add-on elements. And add-on elements are generally used by the more complex customers. These are areas which can be further monetized. So you wanna take these elements and match them to those different use cases you've learned about in your um, understanding value sessions um, through, through either qualitative or quantitative research. Here's an example of a marketing automation platform offering that developed good, better, best packaging. So you see the three packages, demand gen is the good, ABM focus is the better, maximizing ROI is the best. So first they segmented their audience based on use cases and they tried to identify specifically what goals each segment was seeking to accomplish. For example, that middle segment had been identified by their interest in doing account-based marketing and journey mapping. So they, they included those elements in that better version of the product. For that, the, the top of the line, that best um, offering, 
that customer group wanted to focus on customer acquisition costs, and they wanted to use technology to test different options to maximize ROI. So they put those elements into their best um, uh, package. So by doing this, they're really mirroring the segments of that they're targeting, and they're able to monetize those more complex needs by charging more. Now let's move on to the metering or to the price metric. And this is really an important decision. <clears throat> there are several potential metrics. And what you see here are the key options for a SaaS business. And picking the right one really makes a big difference between a strong business with buyers getting a lot of value um, or a product that could be struggling in the market. So let's first look at the let's look at some of these pros and cons, and and, and we'll pick on um, user based metric first. Obviously, that's pricing for each additional user. And in terms of some of the pros, well, it's certainly easy to understand and predict, which is very useful for for a lot of reasons. And often it does align with value. Often buyers do get additional value each time they add another user. But there's also some cons. For many offerings, the incremental value of each user really has its limits. Again, let's think about that marketing automation platform. Generally, only a limited group of either um, marketing, marketing operations, or demand generation practitioners really use an offering like a marketing automation platform. Be beyond a certain number, uh, these vendors are gonna struggle to sell additional users. Additionally, user-based pricing can have some drawbacks. Sometimes customers might opt to buy a limited number of seats to save money. And not only does that result in um, less money for the vendor, but it might also result in less product adoption and actually a, a poor user experience. So you, you definitely want to avoid that. You want to make sure that your, your metric is not creating some activity which is um, impinging on the, on, on the user and the buyer getting the full value. We're actually seeing now more active user pricing, especially where uh, certainly additional users align with value. But you have to be careful here because as you move up market into mid-market, larger enterprise, these customers want to have visibility and control over their spending. So that's a, a key thing to think about. Let's talk about usage-based pricing. And this is you know, just what it sounds like. It's based on how much the offering is actually used. And um, <clears throat> so one of the key pros of this is that some customers, especially smaller, smaller ones, can get started with lower upfront costs with usage-based pricing. And that's actually good beyond even just small companies. It's also good um, in, in, a, in a newly developed market, a market where there's not a lot of players, it's not a well-developed, category, customers want to try and, and get a feeling for whether or not the offering really does provide value and how it provides, provides value. And they don't want to, they don't want to jump in and, and commit. So we see it often used, often from not for a very long time, but it's in the, in the beginning of a life cycle of a category. Of course, there's some drawbacks here, especially as usage starts to creep up uh, customers start to face uncontrollable costs. So again, that's you know a, a consideration. With we're not seeing as much usage-based pricing anymore. What we're often seeing now is a tiered approach with a set of features that align to the use cases, as I showed you. And then each um, package comes with a set of uh, usage units, like seats or um, campaigns or whatever it might be. 
and there's an availability to purchase more usage units as, as you go. How do you judge? How do you make a choice? Um, and what we've created here is, is sort of a, a little questionnaire for, for you to help yourselves and, and judge, judge, your, judge your metrics. And frankly, no metric is perfect. No metric is gonna score perfectly and you're gonna be able to answer all these questions you know, positively. Uh, but these are some, some considerations. Um, Simplicity. A simple test is to ask yourself if the customer can estimate how much of the of the product they're going to purchase next year. So if it's too complex, they're not going to be able to predict. That's not good for them. That's not good for you because you want to be able to have some sort of forecast. Um, <clears throat> will the approach help promote account growth? This is important. Think about your customers growing. Think about what your customers will need more of as they become more successful. Um, a lot of times it's not more seats or not more users. For marketing automation platforms, as an example, <clears throat> as they get more successful, yes, they might add one or two more marketers, but they'll likely have a lot more customers and a lot more contacts. <clears throat> Maybe they'll even run more campaigns. So as marketing automation platform pricers get more sophisticated, they're starting to think about how to use these kinds of metrics within their packaging and pricing model. But again, be careful. Um, you want to allow for growth. You want to support growth, but you want to ensure customers have some, some visibility to how much they're spending and uh, that they are able to sure, ensure it's not going to go out of control. Let's look at look at, exa at an example, and HubSpot's a good example because they're they're doing so many different things um, uh, it, when it comes to packaging and pricing. And first, you see here that they have a free offering to drive user acquisition, and they're offering different freemiums for different functions. So they are definitely functionally aligned with marketing, CRM and sales and service. And you can see the offering is for unlimited users. And I believe it's, it's forever. And um, they invite sharing with colleagues. So this is their, their, their freemium uh, approach. And what I also think is interesting is they they give these detailed explanations of the free versus paid packages. Um, and what you see here is a screenshot. And this is, this is really helpful for understanding why you might want to uh, be upsold um, and gives you an ability to shop yourself and upsell your, yourself. Um, frankly, it looks a little daunting to me. Uh, I'm not a mark. I'm not a marketer, but it it, it looks a little daunting. Um, so again, there's that that tug of war between uh, simplic simplicity and monetizing features. So you see you see that that contradiction. In terms of packaging, they package their offerings across these functional lines, and you see uh, an example here of the of the marketing hub. They've got, um, and they've got tiers from starter to enterprise. So there's plenty of upsell opportunity. They also use bundles. So they've really using, they've, they've got every, every pricing trick in the book here. They bundle products together that have synergy because they all have that same level of company sophistication. So they would have a starter bundle that has starter CRM, starter marker, marketing hub, starter sales hub. Um, when this is done right, these bundles can encourage immediate cross-sell and larger deal size. As, as long as these are uh, complementary products and there's a core offering that is, is in demand like the, like the CRM. So bundles is a really good strategy to get quick, higher deal size. Okay, 
So we went through a, um, a lot of different areas and I wanted to give you some closing recommendations. Um, first, you know, think about the that that balance that we talked about in the beginning and assess your pricing, see how well it does along the goals of simplicity, promoting account growth, and how effective it is in attracting and closing profitable business. You want to be careful of attracting business that is not going to be profitable. So that's important to think about which customers you want to have as, as part of your business and which ones will be less profitable and might, might drag down um, the efforts. If you feel you fall short in any of the goals, review your packaging, review your pricing model, and think about what you know about your customers. And if you don't know enough, start asking. Talk to your customers, your prospects, customers you uh, customers you lost, talking to them, um, customers that you didn't win in a deal as well, as well as um, internal folks will have a lot to say about customer value and how well you're your offering approach meets it. Um, finally, pricing and packaging is not a one and done activity. It is a practice. Organizations and product managers or product marketers should keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on competitive pricing as an example. Competitive pricing is starting to go down. Hmm, that's a signal. Market is broadening. Market is going, um, down market or it's a, and it's a signal for what you might do do you want to move down with that market or is there some are there some things that you can do to make sure you stay up market gain uh customer prospect feedback on your on your packaging on an ongoing basis take note of features that were they can be quickly become um move from nice to have to must have. So from that ancillary category to that uh, mandatory or core category, that can happen very quickly. So take note of how, how your audience is changing and how the products in your category are changing and becoming more sophisticated. Finally, it's important to set rules for pricing um, and, you know, set, Set price ceilings and floors, uh, but how, you know, be prepared to do some discretionary discounting when the payoff is worth it. Is going to help with future growth. Take these steps. Stay balanced with your pricing and in life. And I want to thank you so much. I'm leaving you here with this is this is um, uh, the type of research that you see coming out of Forrester and Serious Decisions um, in terms of our tools and templates uh, on our portal that our clients have access to. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was such an insightful presentation. Uh, I could not agree more that we should not talk about pricing, we should talk about value. We should use research definitely to understand the customer needs is that also packaging is a practice, of course, and that we should set rules for pricing. What you presented is really, really resourceful. And uh, now I have some questions I want to ask you, if I may. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you believe that you can manage effective pricing with a model that combines self-serve and enterprise products? That's a, that's a good question, and I think you can. I, mm -hmm. um, uh, many organizations have a, a self-serve area of their business mm -hmm. where uh, pricing is and packaging is appropriate for that customer base. You probably mm -hmm. have, uh, if they're self-serve, you probably have simpler, simpler packages. You have simpler components in your offering. Mm -hmm. um, whereas enterprise pricing is probably going to be... Um, you're going to be using more volume tiers and and you should have volume tiers baked into your pricing the, mm -hmm. those should not be discretionary discounts you should know you should have set volume tiers for you know for enterprise customers who are going above a certain volume mm -hmm. and then um 
often we do see, you know, enterprise packages uh, slightly different from one company to another, uh, not vastly different, but um, mm -hmm. often those offerings are a little bit more bespoke and, and, and separate from that pricing approach mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. self-serve. Mm -hmm. And I'd say what is often more complex is the sales cycle, mm -hmm. um, right? Whereas you serve, you don't have any salespeople involved, ideally. Um, you have very little support, support people involved. But once you're getting up to enterprise, that's when you're going to have um, more heft in terms of customer su customer success individuals and more of a sales process. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. So another question is, when do you think that pricing should be iterated across the various growth stages of every organization? When should they be iterated, iterated across the various growth, growth stages? stages? Yes, of every organization. How, how do you think that pricing should be done in this way, you know, along the various stages? Um, well, generally what we recommend is that, you know, with a, first of all, everybody should be involved in pricing. The CEO, no matter what, should be involved in pricing. Mm -hmm. It's not just another thing to check off um, for a marketer or product manager. It, it It's part of your product, right? Mm -hmm. It's It should be, just as considered as any major feature, right? Exactly, because of course. If you're including a major feature, there's going to be um, a price component as well. Mm -hmm. So it should be considered as you are initiate as you're thinking about um, going after a market opportunity and initiate initiating an offering. It should be, frankly, I think it should be considered as a uh, key criteria for going into a market whether or not the the need is high value enough that you're mm. going to get a good price. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I think it should be a strong practice in every organization. Um, often what we see is, you know, product managers are responsible for pricing and that's fine. Mm. And then you see price policy, mm -hmm. which is the rules around pricing. Yes. Uh, administ set and administered by sales operations, something like that. And and that's fine. OK, OK, very nice. Mm -hmm. And the last mm -hmm. question. Um, so you said based pricing aligns a lot with uh, all PLG elements, especially with those that are focused on product analytics insights. So do you think that as a model, it will get a higher traction in the future uh, in the future versus seed based pricing, for example? So what do you believe that this model we will get a higher traction in the future or a seed based pricing what was the other model that you're talking about usage usage based pricing yes usage -based. i think that um <clears throat> i think usage based pricing probably mm. would be um would get more traction because mm. frankly i don't even know what what seats mean sometimes um you know uh, sometimes I'm asked should we use users or seats and I, I don't need, you know, sometimes it's not clear what a seat is and often it's adding bodies, which is, I guess what a seat, right. What a seat is, is doesn't mean more value, right. Yes. Um, you can get uh, tons of value from one seat by running as an example, many, many marketing campaigns. So if, if they, if, if the if the vending co if the selling company can do it and do it with simplicity and mm -hmm. do it and by by still ensuring that the customer has visibility to what they're paying for, which is important, uh, I think I would see more of more usage based pricing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa, for the sure. presentation, for the answers, for everything. It was very very interesting talking with you mm -hmm. and. And uh, well, we look forward for a future collaboration with you. Maybe you can join us in the next PLG Disrupt event. So thank you again. Love to. And I wish you, you all the best for the future. OK, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the question. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. And now in the next five minutes, uh, in five minutes, you will join us again for the next talk by uh, Aidan Farjan from Alibaba. So stay tuned. In five minutes, we're back.